Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this Monday afternoon. Uh, joining us today is Maria Maldonado, who's the Director of Education, Cross-Cultural and Patient-Centered Communication. She uh, graduated from the, uh, from the primary care uh, residency program at NYP Cornell and spent uh, time just before joining the Mount Sinai Health System as the Program Director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program and the Associate Chair of Medicine up at Stanford Hospital in Connecticut. She's been the chair of the Alliance for Academic Internal Medicine's Diversity and Inclusion Committee for two years and served on the Association of Program Directors in Internal Medicine Council for three years. We are delighted to have her joining us today talking about equitable care for patients with limited English proficiency. Dr. Maldonado. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and I just want to say good afternoon to everyone and to let you know that it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today, although I really have to confess that I look forward to the time that we can all be in the same rooms together again. So um, I first gave this talk uh, at the beginning of the academic year at Mount Sinai Hospital as part of the Ellen Skolnick Lectureship in Humanism. And this is a lectureship that is given annually in honor of a very special woman. And that talk is typically attended by members of her family. And uh, because some of them were on the West Coast and couldn't be there live um, virtually like we are today, it was supposed to be taped, but unfortunately a glitch uh, prevented that. Um, so we're taping this lecture again for all of you, but also we're going to make sure that her family gets to see this. And I'm reminded again today that there are some very special people who come into the world that serve as an inspiration for all of us. And um, Ellen Skolnick was an exemplar humanitarian who volunteered at Mount Sinai Hospital and also the National Kidney Foundation uh, where she counseled numerous patients on how to live with chronic illness. And she also educated physicians on how to treat their um, patients as human beings and as much more than their illnesses. And she knew the first firsthand the importance of not only clinical excellence, but of compassion, respect, integrity, and empathy between uh, physicians and their patients. And I was deeply honored uh, to be asked to give that lecture in her honor, and I'm glad to be able to remember her again today. So the principles she lived by are principles that we should all live by as we consider our topic today, which is equitable care for patients with limited English uh, proficiency. And this afternoon, we're gonna be talking about one simple thing that we can all do to mitigate disparities and improve patient safety and increase the likelihood that your patients will be satisfied uh, with your care. And I'm wondering how many of you would like to be able to provide that uh, for your patients. And before I tell you what you can do, I'd like to ask you another question. Um, how many of you think that patients should have the ability to communicate in the language they feel most comfortable in? So now if I could be with all of you in person today, I'm certain that all of your hands would be up for both of the questions I've just asked. But if you're like your colleagues across the country, most of us do not practice what we preach. And in a survey of internal medicine residents that we conducted right here at the Mount Sinai Health System, which included uh, all of the residents at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, this was done about two years ago, over 90% of the residents reported that they deferred obtaining formal medical interpretation at least some of the time. Now, as I've already said, we're, we're not unique. And there are multiple studies that have shown that medical students and residents get by without obtaining interpretation. So as internists, like all of us in this room um, are internists, and so our words and how we communicate really matter. And we're not surgeons, and that's not to say that our procedural colleagues are not capable of great compassion and empathy. Well, of course they are, but I make this distinction, however, to underscore that we use our words as scalpels. And as an educator who thinks an awful lot about the ways that patients and physicians communicate with one another, I'm obviously very 
interested in how we wield our words. And by the way, it's a good thing that I'm an internist because I wouldn't have made a good surgeon. I can't even carve a turkey. And back when I was in medical school, my partners would gently take over any attempts at dissecting. And I consider it a real feat of, of um, uh, dexterity that I'm able to get a nasal swab uh, for COVID-19. So now when it comes to caring for patients with limited English proficiency or LEP as I'll abbreviate throughout this talk, I think that we would all agree that the most fundamental thing to promote outstanding patient physician communication is to make sure that you're both speaking the same language. And the way to do that is to obtain formal medical interpretation if you don't speak the same language as your patient. So now if you decide that you wanna close your eyes and you don't wanna to listen to anything else I say today, that would be the one thing that I'd like to imprint on your minds. So um, I have been interested in what it means to care for patients with LEP for over a decade from a scholarly perspective. But from a personal perspective, I'd have to say that it began when I was in my late teens and early 20s, when I served as a cultural broker for my grandmother, uh, who was Puerto Rican. And while she could speak English, her preferred language for communicating for the purposes of medical issues uh, was Spanish. And that's my grandmother. Um, there. And uh, she suffered from severe spinal stenosis, and I'd accompany her to the orthopedic clinic uh, right at Mount Sinai Hospital, where she saw young residents whose faces changed from week to week. And though Spanish was her preferred language, formal medical interpretation was never obtained, nor was she ever told of her right of interpret for, to interpretation. And what complicated things is that while I'm, I'm wondering if many of you are assuming that I speak Spanish fluently given my last name of Maldonado, I in fact speak Spanish almost as well as a three-year-old child. Well, somehow, somehow we muddled through and she was consented for her spine surgery in English. So luckily though, uh, nothing uh, went wrong. So I have no disclosures to de declare. And these are my uh, learning objectives that you see here. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over them. You can see them here at the, at, on this slide, but certainly by the end of this talk, I'll, I, I hope that you will um, be able to achieve these learning objectives. So uh, today I'm gonna focus on three key points. And the first key point is that patients with limited English proficiency are subject to disparities, patient safety errors, increased cost of care, bias, and experience suboptimal patient-physician relationships. The second key point that I'll make is that a commitment to outstanding patient-physician communication uh, can mitigate disparities and that it is possible to achieve even in the face of language discordance between you and your patient. And finally, the third key point I'll make is that systemic interventions are needed. So let's dig into to, uh, this first key point. And um, so it, it, it's been said over and over again that the COVID-19 pandemic tore back the curtain and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Black and Latino patients and those who are impacted by poverty and policies that foster inequity fared much worse with uh, white patients. And over 50% of the COVID-19 US cases were in New York City at the time of me preparing my uh, remarks for this talk. And um, as you can see by this data uh, from the New York City Department of Health, uh, COVID-19 is, is more likely to occur in Black and Latino patients. And Black and Latino patients were more likely to be hospitalized and they were more likely to die as can be seen by this third bar graph. Now, while we can't make the assumption that it was because of language barriers, because of course many Latino patients are bilingual, it does make you wonder. Um, now, the reasons that were proposed for these findings is that Black and Latino patients were more likely to work in so-called essential professions and more likely to have underlying illnesses that made us more susceptible to moderate to severe COVID-19 uh, illness and didn't have the ability to socially distance uh, and work from home. And many immigrants were not able to stop working during the pandemic because they weren't eligible for any of the state unemployment or for payments under uh, the CARE Act. 
Now, um, when we consider the impact of COVID-19 uh, patients with limited English proficiency, we do have to wonder if language barriers didn't get in the way of receiving information quickly and impact their ability to get healthcare quickly as a lot of practices were moving uh, toward providing care telephonically and virtually. Now, one of my patients at that time told me of difficulties that she had getting through to me. And when she wasn't able to speak English, she was actually hung up on. So we you know, can imagine trying to obtain formal medical interpretation where infection control practices include N95 masks, face shields, gowns, and patients too are wearing uh, face masks. And they're in isolated rooms where healthcare professionals want to minimize as much face-to-face -face time as possible. And obtaining formal medical interpretation pre-COVID was already um, an inconsistent uh, practice and COVID-19 exacerbated the, the problem. And so there were several articles that were written in the popular press about these particular uh, barriers. Now, we also know that the timing of the COVID-19 pandemic occurred in tandem with the public charge rule that came out in about February of 2020, right before this. And this was developed to help immigration uh, officials determine if a person was more likely to overutilize public benefits, such as Medicaid, for example. And as you can imagine, these uh, changes discourage many in the immigrant uh, community from using charity-based healthcare for fear that this was gonna negatively impact their immigration status. And while a bulletin was put out by the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, which did encourage people to seek medical care for sy symptoms consistent with COVID-19, stating that it wasn't gonna uh, impact their immigration status, it's easy to imagine how this rule kept those uh, who needed it from seeking um, healthcare. So even before this pandemic, we knew that individuals with LEP face multiple barriers uh, to accessing uh, quality care. And so I wanna tell you about a patient that I cared for when I worked in Stanford, Connecticut uh, several years ago, because I think it's, it's going to illustrate some of the points that I'll be making today. And I'm also um, a strong believer in the power of narrative medicine to promote empathy for our patients and to allow us to see the world uh, through uh, their eyes. So um, this patient was a 29 year old man who was born in Guatemala, who had come to the US to work as a landscaper so that he could provide, he could support his family back home. And four months before I met him, he had presented to the emergency department complaining of fever and abdominal pain. Now at that time, his blood work revealed anemia and elevated liver enzymes. And though the patient denied the use of alcohol, he was counseled to stop drinking and he was discharged from the ED. Two months later, he presented again to the emergency department with the same symptoms. And this time he got a CAT scan, which revealed mild splenomegaly. Now he was diagnosed with diverticulitis, though there was no evidence of that on the CAT scan and he was discharged on Cipro and metronidazole. Now he also had a Lyme titer drawn and this titer was positive, but the confirmatory Western blot was negative. Despite that, he was called at home and prescribed doxycycline. Now the day before we met him in clinic, I reviewed his emergency department data because I wanted to get a sense of the patients that my interns uh, would be seeing so that I could develop some teaching points for them. And as it turned out, I made the diagnosis even before seeing the patient because his complaints included fever and headaches, abdominal pain, he had anemia, abnormal liver enzymes and mild splenomegaly. Now we were in Connecticut um, and this is the, that was the land of tick-borne illness. And this constellation of findings represented a classic case of babesiosis for which despite multiple antibiotics and multiple tests, he had not been treated for nor diagnosed. So you have to ask your question, what happened? I think that implicit and explicit bias played a role here. The assumption was made that this Guatemalan man abused alcohol. 
In addition, we learned that when he was called at home to treat him for Lyme, the conversation was done without formal medical interpretation. So he had no idea what was going on with his condition, what he was being treated for, and why he was continuing to have symptoms. Now, we don't have data about the implicit bias that exists for patients with limited English proficiency, as of course it would be very difficult to depict LEP on the implicit assessment test, but we don't have to look very far to see evidence of ex explicit bias and discrimination that exists against patients with LEP. Because once you tune into it, it's evident all over the place in the way that we assume that everyone speaks English, in the way that we persist in speaking English, even when it's clear that the person does not, and in the frisson of annoyance sometimes that can arise when it's clear that it's going to be a difficult encounter. So the literature is replete with studies that limited English proficiency are subject to disparities. So for example, patients with LEP are more likely to have poorly controlled hypertension than those with English proficiency. They are less likely to have a usual source of care. They're more likely to have trouble getting through to their doctor, like I told you about my patient. They're less likely to get preventive screenings like colonoscopies, mammograms, and pap smears. And patients with LEP are more likely to forego needed medical care and less likely to have a healthcare visit. There are increased costs of care associated with uh, caring with patients with LEP. So uh, patients who did not receive professional interpretation at the time of admission and discharge had an, had an increased le length of stay compared to those who received interpretation. And patients who received interpretation upon admission and or discharge were less likely to be readmitted within 30 days. Patients with LEP are more likely to be admitted in the first place and they are subject to more diagnostic studies. So what happens when formal medical interpretation is utilized? So this study that was done in 2018 um, implemented ready bedside access to phone interpreters. And when they did this, this significantly decreased the readmission rate and led to over a million dollars cost savings. And when the, the intervention was removed, after eight months, the readmission rate again uh, increased. And as you might imagine, patients with LEP are subject to patient safety events. Hospitalized LEP patients are less likely to have documentation of informed consent for common invasive procedures. They're more likely to suffer from serious medication error, have improper prep for tests and procedures, and they had a greater risk of Lyme and surgical infections, falls and pressure ulcers. So it's also been shown that patients with limited English proficiency have suboptimal patient-physician relationships. And patient-physician uh, communication is measured by whether individuals report whether their doctors always explain things in a way that's easy to understand, show respect for them, and listen carefully to them. So on these slides here, you can see that patients with limited English proficiency as depicted by these red lines here are less likely to report that their medical provider always explains things in a way that they can understand. They are less likely to report that their providers always uh, listen to them. And they are less likely to report that their medical provider shows respect for them. So how can we mitigate these outcomes of disparities, the, these cost of care, uh, patient safety events, and suboptimal patient-physician relationships? So this is a busy, kind of a busy slide, but this is um, a slide that was put out by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and they propose key recommendations to improve patient safety uh, for patients with LEP. And this includes collection and tracking of language access needs, developing policy on language access need, and underscoring a, the importance of commitment to care across the entire healthcare system. And so as you can see by this slide, it clearly requires a multi-pronged uh, approach. So let's move into my second key point, 
which is that outstanding patient physician communication can mitigate disparities even in the face of language uh, discordance. And so I'd like to dig into this topic by presenting another patient. And this is a patient that I saw in my practice at the Mount Sinai Health System a couple of years ago. And she was a 70 year old woman. Uh, she had a history of lymphoma. She was presently in remission and she had already received extensive treatment for her cancer. Now she had changed to my practice mainly because of my last name, Maldonado, which as I've already confessed to you is a massive misconception. So she tried to hide her disappointment. And I must say that she did it a little bit unsuccessfully when I greeted her in English. So I sought to reassure her in my limited Spanish. And I said to her, no se preocupa, yo puedo coger una persona que puede hablar español en el teléfono. So she decided to humor me. She didn't walk out of my office. And I obtained a formal medical interpreter by phone and we began. So after I obtained her medical history, I wrapped it up by asking, was there anything else that she thought that I needed to know in order to be able to take care of her? And here I was surprised to see that she had tears in her eyes. And so I thought to myself, what had I missed and what had I done wrong? So I asked her to tell me what was going on. And she said, this is the first time that I feel like anyone's truly taken the time to listen to me and get to know my history. Now that this was coming from a woman who was 70 years old, had overcome lymphoma and gone through complicated treatment. Well, I have to let you know that this brought me close to tears as well. So I wonder how many of you believe that it is difficult to have a therapeutic relationship with your patients in the face of language discordance between you and your patients. And so over my years as a clinician educator doing this work, residents have told me that they think that it's not really possible to have a therapeutic alliance in language discordant relationships. And I, I, I think it's really important to recognize this, that this thought exists because I really believe that it impacts on the care that we provide to our patients with LEP. Now the psychological literature informs us that our thoughts create our feelings. And this is borne out in cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. Now, most of us don't really play cl very close attention to what we're thinking as the 50,000 to 100,000 thoughts a day float through our brain. However, what sets us apart from animals is that we as human beings have the unique ability to think about our thinking. And this is what we mean when we talk about uh, metacognition. So let's take a moment to imagine what the feeling might be of that, you know, the feeling that might be yielded from the thought, a therapeutic alliance is not possible when I don't speak the same language as my patient. Well, we might have the feeling of resignation. And if you're like me, you might experience the emotion of inadequacy since my name is Maria Maldonado and my patients expect me to speak Spanish. We might have the feeling of hopelessness. We might experience frustration. Now I'm making this distinction because of course that thought is not a fact, though we tend to believe it is. There's an old saw that says, don't believe everything that you're thinking. Now the only absolute fact or circumstance is simply that you and your patient do not speak the same language. And that fact leads to different thoughts such as your patients prefer doctors who speak the same language as them, or it's not possible to have therapeutic relationships that I can't speak the same language. And what I'd like to convey to you today is that these are not useful thoughts. It is not a thought that is likely to render positive outcomes. Because if we asked our patients if they'd rather have a language concordant physician or the very best physician to take care of them for the problem they had, if they were guaranteed complete understanding of what was going on, who do you think that they would rather see? So today I'm going to suggest that you consider what you've been thinking when it comes to caring for your patients with LEP. Now, another piece of this puzzle is that our feelings drive our actions. And of course, our actions engender our outcomes. So let's work this through. 
Now imagine again that you have that thought. It's not possible to have that therapeutic relationship with a patient I don't speak the same language as. You might feel frustrated. Now the action may indeed be for you to obtain formal interpretation, but I dare say that this action is not going to be sought joyfully. It's also possible that frustration may not lead to you obtaining formal medical interpretation. You might be feeling frustrated because you think that you don't have enough time. Or so in that case, your action may be to use an ad hoc interpreter, or you might try to get by. You might even defer seeing that patient if you can. So your outcome may be that you have frustrating encounters with patients with LEP to say nothing about the outcomes for your patients. And since you're gonna have obviously a lot of encounters with LEP patients, you need to rethink that approach because actually that could lead to, to burnout. And I'm gonna challenge you today to consider a thought that might lead to more useful emotions, actions, and therefore better outcomes. A thought like, it is possible to have a meaningful connection with patients with limited English proficiency. Or how about this thought? Ensuring formal medical interpretation enables equity for my patients. This can yield to better outcomes for you and your patients. And a question like, how can I have a fantastic interaction with a patient with LEP, despite not speaking the language that they speak? We always get the answers to the questions that we ask. So make sure that you ask good questions and mind your thoughts. Now I wanna push this a little bit further and answer the question, is language concordance between patients and physicians necessary to have good patient outcomes? So in a study that examined quality of diabetes care for non-English speaking patients, they found that patients who were limited English proficiency, limited English proficient and had diabetes, they had better outcomes when their physicians provided formal medical interpretation than those who spoke the same language as their healthcare professional. Now, another study showed that Spanish speaking patients in which phone interpreters were used were as satisfied with, with their care as those who had language concordant providers. And patients were less satisfied when family members or ad hoc interpreters were used. And in a scoping uh, review to explore patient experience of LEP patients, the authors found that patients with LEP do wish to be cared for by language concordant physicians, but if it is not available, formal interpretation is needed and significantly improves patient satisfaction. And so what about outcomes? A recent systemic review of patient provider language concordance and outcomes revealed that medication adherence is not associated with patient physician language concordance, and that there is no association between language concordance and timeliness of treatment, and there is no association between language concordance and shared decision making. They did find that there may be a positive association between concordance and providers listening skills and feeling understood, but there was no evidence between language concordance and likelihood to get uh, vaccinations like the Tdap or the influenza. So I hope that at this point, I've convinced you that formal medical interpretation is a major contributor to improving communication and will not only ultimately mitigate the disparities that exist for patients with LEP, but can enable, can enable a positive patient-physician relationship that engenders uh, patient satisfaction and will make you feel better too. So we know that this is true, right? I, I bet that I didn't really need to go through all of this data to convince you, right? but we don't consistently get interpretation when we need it. In a study that examined language assistance for, for limited English proficiency patients in a public emergency department, the calculated unmet need for those patients was about 84%. And in this study, patients were asked by the registrar what their preferred language was and whether or not they wanted an interpreter. And then later on, they reviewed the records to see what happened. 11% of those patients who indicated that they wanted language assistance were actually seen by a certified bilingual pro professional. And only uh, uh, the, the rest of them, only about 4% had written documentation in the chart that interpretation was accessed. 
Now, we can assume here that the healthcare professionals here were using maybe limited language ability, or they were just trying to get by. Now, this was done in the departments of highest acuity and critical need to triage patients appropriately. Now, it may also be that we're just not documenting use of formal medical interpretation, right? Because another study showed that 66% of patients with limited English proficiency never had documentation during uh, their hospital stay. So this is, this is a reminder for me to make a public service uh, announcement that if you do use a formal medical interpreter, you must document that in the chart or else, as you've already heard, it didn't happen. And if you are a bilingual uh, or trilingual uh, professional, a physician, and you are communicating with a patient in that language, you must document in the chart that you communicated in that language um, because if anything went wrong, at, that needs to be seen in the chart. So why, so why don't we obtain formal medical interpretation? So perhaps answers can be gleaned uh, uh, from a, a study that was performed. It's a, this was a qualitative study that was performed with medical students that explored the hidden curriculum as it related to the care of patients with limited English proficiency. And in this study, four themes emerged. And the first theme was role, model, role modeling. And so medical students talked about appreciating the frustration that are demonstrated by attendings and residents that care for patients with LEP, right? And so this is an opportunity. We have a lot of residents, um, you know, on this uh, on this call today. You know, this is something that you can just like role model for your uh, medical students that this is just something you do matter of factly, right? Another theme that emerged were, were systems factors, that there were inadequate interpreter services, lack of staff knowledge on how to access uh, these services, and not enough identification in advance for those patients who need formal medical interpretation. What about the learning environment? Well, they talked about competing priorities and the seeming low value that was assigned to patients with LEP. And then finally, organizational culture in that some staff members seem to communicate that getting an interpreter seemed to go above and beyond the standard of care. So I'm wondering if any of this resonates with you. And as I've already mentioned here, what's really empowering is that you have the power to be a great uh, role model and to demonstrate that all patients have value and that they do have the right to receive medical information in the language that they prefer. So what about the other factors? And this leads me to my final key point that systemic interventions are needed. So everyone in the healthcare system needs to know that patients have legal rights. And it is surprising that many people are, are not really aware of the law that governs uh, rights for patients with limited English proficiency, although this law is quite uh, established. Now, when we served our, surveyed our residents in our internal survey that I talked about at the beginning of this talk, only about a third of our residents had ever heard of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Title VI um, Act. And this, uh, this Civil Rights Act prohibited dis discrimination based on national origin, providing equal protection for immigrants. And under this law, healthcare providers receiving federal funds are required to provide equal access for limited English proficiency patients. And then in August of 2000, President Bill Clinton signed the executive order of 13166, which was all about improving access to service, uh, improving access to services for persons with limited English proficiency. And then there was the Affordable Care Act, which included a non-discrimination provision section 1557 that built upon the Civil Rights Act um, by extending non-discrimination protections. And up until this law, providing formal medical interpretation was essentially an unfunded mandate. And this changed with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And 15 states directly reimburse providers of healthcare for language interpreters, and New York happens to be one of those states. Now there is a fairly new rule uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services, 
which is going to, which rolls back some of these regulations, which is likely going to widen the gap for our limited English proficient patients. So um, with this rollback, federally funded entities, including um, healthcare um, systems, they're not going to be, uh, they're no longer required to provide these taglines that inform people of their right to receive language assistance. And also, lacking language assistance programs is no longer going to be considered an explicit breach of regular regulatory compliance right so we need to be careful and we need to sort of subscribe to you know sort of um, an ethical code in which we continue to inform our patients of their rights uh, to formal medical interpretation and these are the, uh, the, the national class standards or the culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and human care, which state that all organizations receiving federally, federal funding assure the competence of language assistance provided to LEP patients. Now, so despite this law, we have all of these national standards hospitals are continuing to fall short and we often fail to inform patients of their right to, to an interpreter and to offer language assistance. So, so why, why does this happen? And in order to explain, I'd like to introduce a term that some of you may have heard about and this term is called normalized deviance. Now, Diane Vaughn, uh, who uh, is an American sociologist, she first described this phenomenon of normalized deviance as, normalized, as deviance from normal behavior that becomes normalized in a corporate culture. And this is a process where a clearly unsafe practice comes to be considered normal if it does not immediately result in a catastrophe. And this was first described after the space shuttle Challenger disaster in the early 80s. And as it turns out, the root cause of this disaster was related to the repeated choice of NASA officials to fly the space shuttle despite a dangerous design flaw with the O-rings. So in other words, this disaster could have been prevented. And this phenomenon occurs when people in an organization become so insensitive to deviant practice that it just doesn't feel wrong anymore. So in healthcare, we don't make choices with the intention to create harm. It generally happens because of the barriers that exist to use the correct procedure, such as cost and time pressure. And typically we justify it as necessary, that it's the only way to get by. Now, I think that we all have to take responsibility here because what is more deviant? Not obtaining formal medical interpretation each and every time it's indicated or not putting systemic processes in place to overcome the barriers that exist. So I've witnessed uh, examples of normalized deviance in the sphere of patient physician communication. So for example, uh, it's not unheard of to give healthcare professionals 20 minutes to see a patient like this. An 82 year old person that you're seeing for the first time with a long and detailed medical history who might be hard of hearing and who has limited health uh, uh, literacy. So if I, if I sound a little bit bitter, it's because, well, maybe I am a bit bitter. And germane to our topic here, we don't obtain formal medical interpretation each and every time for our patients with LEP, and we don't vet healthcare professionals on their self-reported language ability. Now, why does that matter? Because many serious medical errors results from violations of recognized standards of practice. So, what I've just talked about underscores the need for systemic educational initiatives. And despite the fact that most internal medicine residents across the country care for a significant percentage of patients with LEP, and, and this is shown here in this slide, this was a study uh, that I was part of where we surveyed internal medicine um, uh, program directors across the country to get a sense of, you know, um, uh, what percentage of their residence panels included patients with LEP. So you can see that a, a good number of us across the country are caring for patients with LEP. 
Despite this, we also found in that same study that many internal medicine residencies don't have a curriculum that's specifically targeted towards caring for patients with LEP. And here at the Mount Sinai Health System and in our internal medicine residencies, uh, we wanted to ensure uh, an educational curriculum here at Sinai. So what we did is we performed a needs assessment and we surveyed all of the internal medicine residents at Mount Sinai Hospital, Mount Sinai Morningside West, Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And we wanted to get a sense of what their behaviors were as it related to caring for patients with LEP, if they had ever deferred obtaining medical interpretation, if they ever used ad hoc interpreters, and also what was their uh, level of education? What education had they received uh, as it related to caring for patients with LEP? And we also wanted to know if they had ever experienced frustration or stress when they were caring for patients with LEP. And then after that, we developed a curriculum and on caring uh, for patients. And then we delivered and piloted that, that curriculum to all of the interns at Mount Sinai Morningside and West. And in that curriculum, uh, we taught residents about the disparities, patient safety, cost of uh, uh, care issues that we uh, just went over uh, in this talk. We talked about the legal rights that patients had. And we also talked about how do you use a formal medical interpreter? How do you know when you need to access it? And also what the problems are with using limited language ability. And then afterwards, we surveyed, we resurveyed those interns who had the curriculum and we compared their pre and post curriculum uh, responses. And so here's what we found. And in, in these slides, the asterisks that you see, that just demonstrates that we saw a significant difference pre and post uh, the curriculum. So we did find that the uh, curriculum improved their perception of didactic uh, training, okay? So that, you know, definitely, uh, you know, residents felt like they were getting a curriculum that was designed uh, to care for patients with LEP. Um, not surprisingly, and thankfully, it increased their awareness of legal rights uh, that patients with LEP had, and it also improved their skills. Right, so residents, the, the interns uh, reported that they were more likely to inform um, uh, patients of uh, their right to LEP patients. Um, they were more confident in their ability to know when these services were needed. Um, they reported that they were more likely to use TeachBack, um, which is widely accepted as um, a practice that improves patient understanding of their assessment and plan. Um, it also increased their likelihood to inform uh, patients of, of their right to interpretation, even if a family member uh, was present, okay? But it did not do anything. They were just as likely to defer using interpretation and also to experience stress and frustration when caring for patients with limited English proficiency. Not so surprising because we only used education as an intervention, but really didn't do any systemic interventions. So while education is a necessary intervention, it is not sufficient. Now, the other thing that I wanna say that it's, it's very important uh, for those of you who are bilingual or trilingual, multilingual um, physicians, it's important to vet your language ability because it's not sufficient just to be fluent in another language because you also need to possess the ability to convey medical information accurately and com competently. However, most internal medicine uh, residency programs don't have a system in place to vet those uh, residents who state that they speak a language other than English. So we found that only about 15% of programs had a process in place to vet residents. Well, vetting, so if we vet residents, is that sufficient? Well, not really, because in this study, um, pediatric res this was a study of pediatric residents 
who um, had been, you know, many of whom were going around using their limited language ability. And then they, they were tested on their ability to see if they actually were competent in that other language. And as it turned out, only 30% of those who were using their limited language ability were actually proficient in using that language. But this study really sought to see, well, if we vet people, will they, and they find, and we find that they're not competent and they know that they're co not competent, are they going to be less likely to use that, uh, their limited language ability? Well, it turned out that they were less likely to use that language ability in straightforward clinical encounters. But there was no difference. If you look at complex uh, clinical encounters and clinical encounters with legal content, there was no significant difference in their likelihood to use their limited language ability even after being uh, vetted. So what about ad hoc interpreters? So those staff that we count on to provide interpretation in a pinch. Well, one study found that 20% of interpreters at a large health organization lacked the bilingual skills needed to serve as interpreters in a medical encounter. Anecdotally, at one of our Sinai hospitals, 90% of those who applied to be certified as a formal medical interpreter failed the basic screening. And so finally, uh, we have to address the barrier of time, right? So time has been cited as a challenge for decades, and we have to acknowledge that, in fact, it does take more time to care for patients with LEP, and we need to provide the needed resources to address this. So what might, you know, we're coming to the end of this talk, so what might inc increase interpreter use? So I hope you recognize that our limited language ability is not sufficient. We need to recognize that patients are legally entitled to receive formal medical interpreters. We need to appreciate the lack of formal medical interpretation leads to adverse patient outcomes and ex exacerbates disparities. And we also need to recognize that use of professional interpreters is associated with improved clinical care. So, I, I want to ask you, you know, because all, you know, most of you are physicians in training right now. And I think that all of us have to do the basic work in defining the kind of physicians that we want to be so that we can work towards being the kind of physician that practices equitable care. And so I want you to, to ask yourself uh, these questions, you know, what policies do you want to propagate and uphold? right? Do you believe in equitable care? What does that look like for patients with limited English proficiency, right? And how do you know that you've achieved it? And how will you advocate on behalf of your patients? And I, I, I hope that you know that you really have the power to change a system just by shining a light on what you know is not right, okay? So, um, I, I want to be mindful of the time here, but I would like to leave you with one final thought. You know, Ellen Skolnick, Skolnick uh, the woman that um, I had the pleasure and privilege of honoring and who I have the pleasure and privilege of remembering today, once said this simply and beautifully, my doctors want me to be there for them as much as they are for me. They want me to understand what's going on with my health. And when I don't understand, they answer all of my questions. So let's honor her memory by being the kind of physicians that in her lifetime, she inspired many physicians to be. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your time. And I hope that one day that I'll have the opportunity to meet some of you um, in person. Excellent, Dr. Maldonado. Thank you so much. We have about six more minutes, um, and I'm sure people have questions. Um, and I'll invite them either to unmute themselves or to type them into the chat. Um, maybe I'll start by asking about um, what about ASL and people who um, where the communication is through like a sign language interpreter? Does that present these same sort of challenges? Is that like sort of off of, on a, its own? Topic. Yeah, yeah, and I did not, I did not um, address that um, because that has its own set of uh, challenges, right? 
Um, you know, and, and systemic interventions are definitely needed uh, for that because you obviously need to get that, you need to uh, make arrangements uh, to have somebody who's certified to provide uh, that interpretation in advance, right? And there are times that that just doesn't that just doesn't happen. I'm sure some of you have had that happen where you have somebody show up in 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 the office, or you know even in the hospital. Can you imagine in the hospital how that is to have somebody there on a continual basis? And so that that requires um, a lot of time, a systemic intervention and advanced planning, and certainly adds an, another level of complexity. Steinberg. Quick comment. So thank you, Dr. Maldonado, for a great talk. I love the phrase, shine a light on the issue. That's exactly what we should be doing. I will just offer to people, there is a very concrete way that any of you can shine a light on an event or an episode of bias or discrimination, including, of course, something that affects patients with LEP, and that is to put it into safety net. In safety net now, we have recently added question which says, um, do you believe bias or discrimination played a role in this event? And it's a yes or no. It's not a mandatory question. So you can still log whatever you want and not put that in. Um, but there's the opportunity to put that in. We want to know about these things. Um, so, so there's a step that, that any, anybody can take uh, to shine a light on it as Dr. Maldonado so, so brilliantly put it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Other questions, thoughts? Nothing. Dr. Maldonado, I think you did. Thank you so much for joining us today. It, it, it was it was a pleasure. And uh, good luck. Good luck with the uh, with the rest of this uh, recruitment season. And uh, anybody who ends up at, at Mount Sinai Beth Israel is fortunate indeed. So thank you very much.